Good morning. <laughs> you get to hear it several times. <laughs> Such a joy to hear you all singing that song. It's one of my favorites, and I think it's just really appropriate for this weekend. In order for us to speak well, we need to listen to the Lord who speaks. Correct? Is that right? So, this morning we are going to be considering the truth to speak. And I would like you to consider speaking the truth in love as if it were a coin. When you give someone a coin, you can't give them only one side of a coin. You have to give them both sides of the coin. That is the nature of a dime or a quarter. You must give the whole coin. And the same is true of speaking the truth in love. As Christians, we should never give only one side of the coin. We should always give truth with love or truth with grace. And so this weekend, I'm not gonna be delving in real deeply with you on the side of the coin that is about the love part and the graciousness part. I hope that in general that comes out and in what you hear and what you discuss in your small group time. But if you wanna be encouraged and challenged specifically on that side of the coin, on the love side and the graciousness side, I recommend that you read three chapters in the book When Words Matter Most. There are three chapters in that book that are specifically devoted to that aspect of speaking truth. One of those chapters is called The Greatest Love, I'm sorry, The Greatest Grace. And that is all about how we as Christians experience the grace of God in Christ and how that should then inform how we are gracious with one another. The next chapter is The Gracious Friend. And there we really took the time to look throughout the scriptures to see how does the scriptures teach us to be gracious in our character, in our conduct, and in our conversations. And then finally, we had to include this chapter. It's called When Grace is Tested. Now, we can be as gracious as we possibly can, but sometimes our friend is not going to receive it. Sometimes it's still difficult for her to listen or to hear or to receive. And so we wanted to take a chapter and just address that and, and give you some things to think about from Scripture on how do I then respond when grace is being tested. And so before we stop, talk about the truth to speak, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day that you have made it is a day from your hand, and so we rejoice in it, knowing that it is good, for you are good. Lord, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your compassions that never fail. They are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. Lord, you are our portion. You are our good. When all else around us may not seem good, we know that you are. And so, Lord, I thank you for these women who have come here today that have taken time out of their busy lives and full weekends to come and fellowship with one another and to hear um, truth from your word. And, Lord, I pray as they wait upon you, even here, that you will be their hope. I pray, Lord, that they will seek you and that they will enjoy your salvation that you have given. Lord, I pray for all of us to have ears to hear. May we be doers of your word and not hearers only. And it's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen. In 1784, a baby named Mary Jones was born to a poor family of weavers in Wales. Her father died when she was four years old, and Mary and her mother were introduced to a life of poverty. Mary came to personal faith in Christ when she was eight years old. And at age 10, she began attending school and she had to walk two miles each way to school and to come home. But she was very eager to learn to read. And the reason why is because she had expressed how badly she wanted to read the Bible. 
Later, a Sunday school was established in her area and she faithfully memorized the catechism and entire chapters of scripture. Welsh Bibles were rare and expensive at that time and there were only two Bibles in her community. One was at the church and the other belonged to the Evans family who of course lived another two miles away. Mrs. Evans permitted Mary to come and read their Bible whenever she liked as long as she removed her clogs before she entered the parlor. And so for six years, Mary walked once a week to the Evans farmhouse to read and memorize the Bible. Mary desperately wanted her own Bible, and so during this time, Mary worked especially hard and saved money however she could. Now you can imagine the challenge that would be since they were already very poor. And she saved her money with the hopes that one day she could have a Bible of her very own. After six years of working and saving in 1800, when Mary was almost 16 years old, she had enough money to purchase her own Bible. She now had three shillings and six pence. And so Mary, who was accustomed to walking long distances, now had a challenge. She now had to walk 26 miles to the town of Bala to purchase a Bible. She had heard that there was a Reverend Thomas Charles there who would sell them. And so she set out to do that. She walked most of the way there barefoot because she was concerned about saving her clogs for the walk back home. Thomas Charles was so moved by this teenager who appeared on his doorstep that he arranged lodgings for her to stay for a couple nights, and then he sold her three Bibles for the price of one. The inspiring story of Mary's desire and determination to have a Bible of her own spread among the surrounding churches. Mary later married a weaver. She had six children, five of whom died from disease. Later in life, Mary lost her sight and could no longer read her Bible, yet she could recite long passages of scripture by heart. Mary also lost her husband and she died as a widow at age 80 in 1864 with her most valued possession on the table next to her bed. And of course, that was her copy of the Bible that she bought as a teenager from Charles 64 years earlier. I wonder what kind of stories Mary could tell about God's faithfulness and the trials of life. I wonder what her favorite Bible passages and stories were. Which Bible verses did God use to strengthen her and give her hope in her darkest hours? Which scripture passages did she share with others in their darkest hours? I wonder which pages of her Bible were the most worn and why? Why am I telling you about Mary Jones? She was just a simple woman with a simple life. It was an obscure life of poverty and loss. I'm telling you about Mary Jones because in actuality, her life was filled with true riches and delight and strength. She knew her God and she knew his word. She abided in the scriptures and Christ abided in her and with her and she found him to be faithful to the very end. She could stay with the psalmist, I have been young and now I am old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. She cherished her God by cherishing his word. Like Mary Jones, are we women who truly desire God's word? Are we willing to sacrifice much in order to receive it? Are we women who are determined to fill our hearts and our minds with it? Are we women who understand its value? Are we women who understand its power to change lives? In Ephesians 4.15, we saw that like last night, that we are called to speak the truth in love so that we will all grow up in Christ. This morning, we are going to give more thought to what we are called to speak and of course, that what is the truth of God's word. Sometimes in your conversations with others who are struggling, you may share a Bible verse that is helpful to them. And maybe you just mentioned that in passing. 
Sometimes you may have the opportunity to actually have a sit down conversation and you're able to open the Bible and read some verses and maybe talk with your loved one about what those verses mean and how they actually apply in her situation. Other times you may just have conversations over a cup of coffee or on the phone with someone and your conversation is just saturated and rooted in biblical truth, biblical wisdom and insight. So whether you are sharing a verse with chapter and verse, you know, just right there very clearly, or maybe when you're just speaking from the heart, when your loved one is struggling, what she needs to hear from you, what is the most necessary thing that she hears from you is biblical truth. And so to help us understand why this is, this morning we're going to consider these things. First of all, four unique attributes or characteristics of scripture, five things scripture accomplishes in the life of a believer, and six ways to faithfully handle the word of God when speaking truth and love. And so let's begin with the four attributes of scripture. The Bible is a collection of 66 books written by 40 different authors over a 1500 year period on three different continents in three different languages. These facts make it stand apart from any other literature that has ever been written, and yet there is much more that makes the Bible infinitely superior to all other writings, and it is its attributes. And so the first one we're gonna consider is the authority of scripture. The authority of scripture. The scriptures are the authority for all that we believe and do because they are the actual words of the living God. First Thessalonians 2.13 says this, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. The Bible is the inspired word of God. In the Bible, the word inspired means God breathed. In the scriptures are the thoughts and words of God from God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Second Peter 1.21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what is inspiration? MacArthur describes it this way, inspiration is God overseeing and directing men to write his words it is the process by which God, as the instigator, works through human prophets without destroying their individual personalities and styles to produce divinely authoritative writings. So since the source of scripture is God, it carries the authority of God himself. Listen to how King David describes God's unequaled authority over all things in 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. God's authority is revealed to us through his word and we must respond rightly to that authority. Theologian Wayne Grudem explains it this way, to disbelieve or disobey any word of scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God himself. I'll read that again. To disbelieve or disobey any word of scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God himself. God's word communicates to us who he is and what he requires of us who he is, his character, his promises, his plans, his works, what he requires of us, all things regarding our faith and our obedience, what to believe and how are we to live for his glory. Since scripture is from God, it is his inspired revelation of himself. It is the authority for all of life. So what does this matter when speaking the truth in love? We can be confident that scripture is absolutely necessary, right, and good for us all to fully submit our lives to it. 
The next attribute of scripture is the inerrancy of scripture. The Bible is true in all it says. It is inerrant, meaning it's without error in the original autographs and all that it affirms, whether in history, science, morality, or faith. Again, Wayne Grudem describes it this way, the Bible always tells the truth, and it always tells the truth concerning everything that it talks about. In Psalm 119, 160, it says, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The sum and the specifics. God's word reflects the truthfulness of God himself, just like God's word reveals the authority of God himself. Because God is truthful, his word is truthful. He cannot lie, for that would contradict his holy nature. Titus 1-2 describes God as the one who never lies. Hebrews 6-18, it is impossible for God to lie. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. Why does this matter when we speak the truth in love? It's because we can know that when we speak God's truth, it is reliable, faithful, and trustworthy for us and those who hear it. Next, the clarity of Scripture. This attribute also has another fancy name. It's called perspicuity. So the perspicuity or the clarity of Scripture. To say that Scripture has clarity means that the average person who reads it or understands it, or who reads it, can understand its basic message. Some passages may be a little bit more difficult to understand at first or to interpret, but the Bible is generally understandable. It is written so that one of the children in your Sunday school program here can understand it, as well as some seminary professor locked away studying in his office. The Word of God is open for all to read, all to consider and to understand. Whether someone is a king or a shepherd boy, or both, it is comprehensible. That shepherd king, David, wrote this, Psalm 119, verses 90 through 100, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Because the scripture has clarity, we can know that when we speak it in love, it is understandable, helpful, and meaningful to those who receive it by faith. Next, the sufficiency of scripture. The Bible contains all the wisdom of God that we need to live in faith and obedience to him. It is fully sufficient. It is fully complete for our salvation and sanctification. I read this earlier, but I'm gonna add the rest of the verse or the following verse. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's word is given so that we will be prepared, that we will be sufficiently and completely prepared to live for him and to glorify his name. Scripture is fully capable to make us imitators of Christ in everything, in what we do, in what we think, what we say, what we believe, and women, even in what we feel. Matthew Henry wrote this, by, by it, meaning the scriptures, we are thoroughly furnished for every good work, whether or whatever duty we have to do, whatever service is required from us, we may find enough in the scriptures to furnish us for it. Now, you might think, but you know, there's a lot of things in life that I don't think the Bible talks about. So is it really sufficient? Of course, I'm gonna say yes, and this is what I mean. The Bible is sufficient in this way. Scripture addresses every issue and circumstance of life in one way or another, by principle or command, so that you can honor and glorify God in it. So for example, does the Bible give us a checklist for how to change a tire? Wouldn't that be nice for some of us? <laughs> but does the Word of God teach us how to change a tire? With patience? With thanksgiving that you even have a tire to change? 
Does the word of God tell us who to marry? First name, middle name, last name? No. But does the Bible tell us who to marry? Yes. We are to marry someone in the Lord. And those of you who are still looking or waiting for a husband, I would also say go to Proverbs. Look for the wise man, not the fool. Does the Bible give us a list of how to fill out our taxes? Does it include a tax code to follow? No, but does it tell us how to fill out our taxes? Yes, with honesty and for some of us with endurance. Because God's word is sufficient, when we speak God's truth and love, we can have every confidence that the Bible contains all the answers and all the wisdom that we and our loved ones need to walk with God faithfully. So God's word has all authority, it is inerrant, it is clear, and it is sufficient. But what does God's word actually do? What does the Holy Spirit accomplish in us through the scriptures? So let's consider the work of God's word in us. Now, back when I was in high school, I went through an extended time of sorrow for various reasons. Um, I was never diagnosed as having depression. Probably today I would have been diagnosed having that. But um, it went on for quite a while. And one day I was on the phone with one of my friends. She was my peer. Maybe we were 16 years old or so. She was a believer. It was after school. I was sitting in my mom's bedroom on her bed with a landline. Those of you who know what that is. And I was just boohooing to my friend and complaining, and she'd probably been hearing this for months. Her name was Kiri. And Kiri said to me, um, Cheryl, I want you to go in the other room and read 2 Corinthians 4, and I'm now hanging up on you. <laughs> Click. <laughs> no one had hung up on me before, so I, I couldn't believe she had just done that. But for some reason, I said, okay. And so I walked into my bedroom, got out my Bible, and turned to 2 Corinthians 4 and almost makes me teary. I am so thankful she said that and hung up on me. <laughs> God used 2 Corinthians 4 in the next several weeks to just change me, to transform me, to um, give me new perspective on life. Um, I read it, studied it, marked it, memorized it. I still remember driving down the street in my little VW bug, and I know this was really dangerous, but I actually had my Bible turned to 2 Corinthians 4 on the steering wheel driving down the street. Very foolish 16-year-old. Do not recommend that. So I don't think my story is unique. I, I think it's rather ordinary. It's just a snapshot of one of many times that God has used a portion of scripture in the life of one of his children to bring healing and restoration. If you are a Christian, I know it's very likely that you have your own stories of circumstances or seasons of your life when God used specific verses or passages to help you change in a unique way. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it says that God's word performs its work in you who believe. I just love that phrase. It performs its work in you who believe. The Holy Spirit uses his word to accomplish several things in a believer. As we and the believers we speak with receive and believe God's word, we can know that God is working in the following ways. Number one, scripture increases our knowledge of God. It is in the scriptures that we learn who God is. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says this, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Here we have both the Old and New Testaments represented. In the 39 books of the Old Testament and the poetry and the prose of the prophets and other writers, God revealed himself. He revealed his character and his redemption to his people. And with the coming of Christ... God again has revealed himself and our redemption. That was made known to us in our Savior, and the New Testament reveals him and explains him. The whole of Scripture is God's self-revelation to us. God reveals himself to us on every single page. 
who he is and what he's like. He also reveals to us in scripture how he relates to us in our sorrow and in our weakness, in our sin and in our suffering. I love Exodus 34 verses six through seven. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Number two, scripture sanctifies us. Scripture instructs us about who we are and who we are becoming. We are children of God being conformed to the image of Christ. And so again, what does it mean to be sanctified? It basically means to become more like Jesus in faith and obedience, in heart and conduct, to forsake sin and to pursue godliness. And in this process of sanctification, this is what scripture does. First of all, it teaches us to battle and to overcome sin. A familiar verse, Psalm 119, verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Secondly, not only does it teach us to battle sin, it teaches us to obey. What are we to put off? What are we to put on? Psalm 119, verse 31, I have chosen the way of faithfulness I have set your rules before me. When praying for us, Christ emphasized this incredible connection between scripture and sanctification. John 17, 17, he prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Next, scripture makes us wise. It makes us wise in a couple ways. First of all, it makes us wise for salvation. It teaches us how to be reconciled to God. 2 Timothy 3.15 describes the word of God as the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Second, God's word makes us wise for daily living. We see that throughout the scriptures, but especially again in Proverbs. And we find in Proverbs 1, 2, and 3, these words, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. God's thoughts and ways are higher than ours, just like we heard earlier this morning. But as we read and meditate on his word, our thoughts and ways become more like his. We learn to discern truth from error, we learn to make choices according to the commands and principles of scripture. So step by step, day by day, as we are taking in the word of God, our foolishness is replaced with God's wisdom. And this wisdom is described in James 3.17. It is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, merciful, impartial, and sincere. Is that the kind of woman you desire to be? If so, then seek the wisdom of scripture. Next, scripture encourages us, and we all know that. God's word provides us with hope and encouragement as we see his character works and promises in scripture. God's word gives us hope. Again, Psalm 119, 147. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words, comfort, Psalm 119, verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promises give me life. Strength. Psalm 119, verse 28. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. In times of trial, God's word fortifies our faith and enables us to endure. Last thing that those scriptures do for us in our list today. Scripture brings blessing into our lives. Every good gift is from the Lord, including the blessings we receive by ordering our lives according to his word. Psalm 128, one through two says this, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of your labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it will be well with you. For example, if you order your finances according to the principles of scripture, then you can enjoy freedom from debt. If you forgive as scripture teaches us to, you can enjoy peaceful relationships. If you 
pursue purity and honesty as described in God's word, you can enjoy living with a clear conscience. When we sow God's word into our lives, we reap its good fruits. Psalm 119, 56, this blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. You can know that when you speak God's truth and love, his word is powerful to accomplish all these things in his people. So lastly, let's think of how we can faithfully handle God's word when we speak the truth in love. What can we do to be both careful with the scriptures and helpful to those we care about? So six ways to faithfully handle the scriptures when speaking truth in love. First of all, and very obvious, carefully study God's word for yourself. 2 Timothy 2.15 be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Be a student of the word. Be devoted to taking in scripture, as it says in Romans 12 too. Be transformed by the continuous renewing of your mind. I think it was from years ago being in Fundamentals of the Faith that I learned this illustration of different ways to take in God's word and using the fingers to uh, illustrate that. First of all, we listen to God's word, we read it, we study it, we memorize it, but the last one is reserved for the thumb. What do you think that may be? We meditate upon it. Why is meditation on the thumb? Meditating meaning thinking carefully for the purpose of application. Because in order to grasp with any of the other fingers, you need your thumb, right? So if you want to grasp God's word as you listen to God's word in the sermons here or during the week online, be thinking carefully, how does this apply to my life? If you read, if you study, if you memorize, always be very thoughtful. Don't be one who is passive as you take in scripture. Become devoted to good study methods. And those are observation, interpretation, and application. Observation. What does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? Application, how am I to believe and to live? And for some of you, maybe the, the best thing for you to do is ask one of the other ladies here who you know, knows how to study your Bible, maybe it's a friend or a Bible study teacher, and, and ask her, can you teach me this? Can you give me some guidance as I grow in learning to study and read the Bible for myself? There are a few resources that are very helpful, but I just want to mention two. One is a classic. It's called Living by the Book by Hendricks, and the other is How to Study the Bible by MacArthur. Another thing I encourage you to do as you are here on Sundays, um, or if you're in a Bible study, Bible study during the week, is listen carefully to those who are preaching and teaching. Notice how they walk through observation. Notice as you listen how they are interpreting and then how they apply. There is such a benefit of being in a church that teaches the word of God well, year after year after year. Absorb that, take that in, and let that influence how you then approach the scriptures on your own. As you grow in your own knowledge and understanding of scripture, you will become better equipped to help others from God's word as well. A great example of this in the scriptures is Ezra in the Old Testament. Ezra was a prophet scribe who led the Jews back to Jerusalem during the second return from the Babylonian exile. And there's a little verse tucked away in Ezra 7, it's verse 10, and it says this, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Notice that progression study, do, teach. For us, we take it in, we learn to live it, and then we can share it with those around us. And that is just a constant progression, a constant um, approach in our lives. Next, don't add to God's word. When scripture, or when speaking God's truth to one another, focus on sharing what scripture says about God, about your friend, and about her choices and circumstances. Beware of giving your own personal applications, opinions, suggestions, as if they are the ultimate answers to her problems. 
Of course, there are certainly times when it is appropriate for us to give practical application of biblical truth, but be very careful to never evaluate your applications of Scripture to the level of the authority of Scripture itself. The transforming wisdom your friend needs is from the Lord, not you, not herself, not in social media influencers or self-help books. Do not mix worldly wisdom with the truth of Scripture. Learn to discern human ideas and standards that conflict or diminish Scripture. Jesus warns of this in Mark 7, verses 6 through 7. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So just as we should not add to God's word, we should not take away from God's word either. And for this picture, I have some cookie dough. And so is it, we'll see if it's there, cookie dough. Why cookie dough? Well, when my children were small, I decided to make them some oatmeal cookies. And, but they were all running around me and I was distracted. And I made cookies without a very important ingredient. <laughs> and that was flour. Somehow I literally spooned this stuff onto a baking sheet and put it in the oven. And when I came back later, I didn't have cookies. I had some sort of very strange granola. I left out an important ingredient. God's word, though, is a perfect recipe. We need to be very careful not to ignore or skip something in scripture that a loved one needs to hear. If there's something in God's word that would be helpful or needful for your friend, resist the temptation to hold back from sharing it because you are afraid that she might disagree, she might be offended, or maybe she just doesn't appreciate it. Commit yourself not to minimize or compromise what the Bible says. Pray for grace and courage to share what needs to be heard and leave the results with God. Be committed to the whole truth of God's word. Jesus emphasized this in Matthew 5, 19. He said, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Next, point your friend to Christ and his gospel and its implications for her life. In other words, show her both the indicatives and the imperatives of scripture. So what are indicatives? Indicatives are the statements of truth that we find in the Bible. These are what the Bible, these are things that the Bible indicates. These are things that the Bible says about God, about his gospel and about grace. What are imperatives? They are the commands of scripture. They are the instructions we, we, we receive. Paul shows the important connection between indicatives and imperatives in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. These are familiar verses, but I will read them to you. Starting at verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Full of indicatives full of truth about God's saving grace, that we are saved by grace alone. But then he goes on, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In these verses, we see that it is God's grace that saves a person, but we also see that it is out of that saving grace that a person then lives to the glory of God. Saving grace precedes obedience that honors the Lord. We can find the indicatives of God's grace and the imperatives of obedience to him tied together all throughout scripture. And so I have a couple of examples of these for you, but I do want you to really seriously consider that when you are talking with a friend, whether it's an issue of encouragement or an issue of admonishment, give her both. Take her to the truth of scripture and then show her how God calls her to walk in faith and obedience out of that grace. 
So, for example, in Ephesians 4.32, maybe you have a friend who is holding a grudge. Listen to this verse. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. What is the indicative? God in Christ has forgiven her. And so then, what is the imperative that you can then discuss with her? That she is to be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Philippians 4, 5 through 6, maybe you have a friend who is just racked with worry. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to him. What is the indicative The Lord is what? The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? The Lord is near. The Lord is with her. The Lord is present. The Lord is aware. Even more so, the Lord is active. So how is she then to respond? Do not be anxious, but pray. You can say to her, you know, let's do this together. I know you're worried about such and such. I know you're anxious, but the Lord is with us. He's with you. Let's pray together. Let's put this into practice. Show her the indicative and then move her into the imperative. Always point your friend back to Christ. Remind her of God's grace and goodness to her in the gospel, but also remind her of how God directs her to live for him out of the grace that she has received from him. Next, how do we move through speaking the truth in love? We pray. We acknowledge our dependence on the Lord and we ask for his very real help. Pray for wisdom and boldness and patience as you have conversations. Prayer is a declaration of your dependence on the Lord. Pray for your loved one. Pray for her circumstances but also pray for her heart. Pray for yourself. You having these kind of conversations is sanctifying for you as well. Pray that God will make both of you more like Christ. Follow the example of Christ who prayed for his people. Again, in John 17, 17, Christ was praying for us and we must pray for one another. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Like Jesus, pray that God will use his word mightily in your friend's heart and life. And finally, trust the Lord to use his word as he intends to do his good work in his good time. God's word is powerful to accomplish his good purposes in our lives and the lives of those we love. Isaiah 55, 11, that we heard earlier, God says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And Philippians 1, 6, this was such a meaningful verse to me during that time back in high school. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. We can't see all that God is doing, but we can know for certain that he is at work saving and sanctifying his people. At the beginning of this session, I told you a story of Mary Jones, the poor Welsh girl who walked 26 miles to get her very own Bible. But I must confess, I did not tell you the whole story. There is more to the story. Thomas Charles, the man who sold her the Bible, was so impacted by Mary's determination and sacrifices to receive her own copy of the scriptures that he did much more than just provide her with a place to stay and three Bibles for the price of one. Realizing that there must be many more people in Wales like Mary who couldn't afford their own Bible, and two years later in December 1802, Thomas Charles traveled to London to attend a meeting with the Religious Tract Society to discuss how Bibles could be made affordable and available to the people in Wales. At that meeting, as the need for Bibles was discussed, there was another reverend by the name of Joseph Hughes who posed this question, quote, if for Wales, why not for the kingdom, meaning Britain, and if for the kingdom, 
What, why not for the world? In other words, he was challenging these people saying, hey, if, if we have a vision to get Bibles to Wales, what about the rest of Great Britain? And then if, if that, why not the rest of the world? Well, as a result of that conversation, two years later in 1804, with the support of William Wilberforce, who was the English abolitionist and the famous member of parliament, Thomas Charles and other prominent leaders established the British and Foreign Bible Society. Now, over 200 years later, it is called simply the Bible Society, and it is still actively translating, producing, and distributing Bibles in over 200 countries, primarily in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Mary Jones was a very small spark that lit an enormous fire. Today, if you travel to Wales, you can sign up to follow her 26 mile walk. You can take a walking tour from her town to Bala, where she bought her first Bible in 1800. Or you could never leave Phoenix, Arizona and still walk in her footsteps by cherishing the word of God. Mary Jones had no idea that her commitment to the scriptures would impact people for generations and into eternity. You have no idea how your commitment to the scriptures will impact others for generations and into eternity as well. May we never underestimate the power of God's word to change lives. Amen. Let's pray. Before we pray together, I'll give you a moment to pray silently on your own as you reflect upon um, some of the things you've heard this morning. And again, as you consider who you can be speaking truth to and love. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your faithfulness that reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness that you have placed in our very hands in the scriptures. We pray, Lord, that we will be um, faithful with the word that you have given. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us and who empowers us to love one another in the ways we have described this morning. Thank you, God, for um, taking us, those who are fools in the eyes of the world, and you have given us the wisdom of your very heart and mind. Lord, may we cherish your word, and may we encourage others to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen.